Right, okay. Uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and welcome to um, PTIC. Um, we've got some um, interesting updates uh, for you this afternoon. Um, so um, I haven't had any apologies directly myself, Sean, other than Sean. Yeah, so Sean's not with us yet. He might be able to join us later. Um, don't know whether you've had any, Teresa. No. Okay. Um, in, which, uh, in which case, let's do a um, quick go through the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, which was um, back in February. Um, so, uh, uh, NAPTAN, um, yeah, there was a load of NAPTAN events, quite a good turnout for those. Um, there's been another one recently which had a good turnout, and no doubt um, Dr. J will give us an update um, on what's happened and what's coming up in a bit. Um, then the next one, um, was, um, yeah, Neil and Ian, um, were talking about stock locations and map bases, um, and uh, that will be coming up, um, in a nap time workshop fairly soon. Um, I forget which one, I think it's in July, uh, it is on the list. Um, and Alex, uh, I, yeah, forgive me, I owe you a uh, conversation about OSM and Trip Planner. Um, so uh, I'll pick it up with you um, shortly. And um, yeah, um, Block ticketing exemptions um, that um, consultation has now closed only a few days ago, a week ago, something like that. Um, so um, those of you um, that put a response in, thank you. Um, and um, yeah, the other one was just uh, make sure you let Bod's help desk know if you've got any problems. Um, okay, any comments on the last minutes? No? Okay, um, so let's um, jump um, straight into update on BODS. Um, we've got Jan um, from the Open Data team, welcome, Jan. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, does everyone see my screen? Uh, I've just put on just a yes. the standard slide, just with an overview of the latest data uh, in terms of take up for the Plus Open Data Service. But uh, I'll just talk you through um, what we've been working on uh, recently. So as um, Tim has mentioned before, in the policy wise, we are have a registry. Um, we are working on uh, bus registration and reviewing how we want to proceed with uh, um, digitalizing uh, bus registration, updating the implementation guidance for BODS, as well as including occupancy data within the guidance. Um, we are currently testing the data quality validator for the Transit Exchange 2.4 PTI profile, and it's almost complete, and uh, we expect it to be released before the end of this month. So next uh, few days. Um, in terms of take up, all the big five are now publishing AVL data with uh, 219 operators out of three, uh, um, 322 using. Oh, so apologies for the uh, users of tickets or ETMs. Uh, we have uh, 219 out of 322 operators providing uh, AVL data. Um, of our left hand team at the FT uh, as part of the service. 
assessment, which is a really good uh, milestone, and now focusing on accessibility and future strategies for the team. Uh, our business change a team at Fonds are focusing currently on registering publishers are not currently publishing or only have published one data set. Uh, from a DVSA side, uh, they have, they're about to send out an official letter this month to approximately 40 operators who have been contacted by our team but have uh, not responded back. Um, uh, all the GTFS data in the OPUS Open Data Service now has uh, includes shapes or tracks data, depending how you like to call it. And the disruptions messaging tool has now been uh, fully novated to DFT. And uh, we plan to have the consumer APIs uh, to be provided by BODS by November this year. And we're also at the same time. Um, exploring options for predictions data being provided later this year and uh, yeah stay tuned for that does anyone have any questions there's quite a lot of information to rattle through there yeah it's seeing that Lancashire just picking up on the chasing of operators who are registered etc there we're involved with this as well because we ended up with getting in touch with DSA there yeah. There seems to be a difficulty in distinguishing between the operators who run school services on behalf of the county on local authorities that don't really have a requirement to register them or if they have the schools and works they're not within the scope of the of BOS, you know uh, following the documents that was sent out to say how you work out if a service should be there or not and they appear to be chasing the wrong guys and that the chasing operators are operating purely school services on behalf of the county council. And we've had, well, I've had probably about half a dozen conversations with concerned operators on this. And you try to say, well, no, you, you, your services do not meet the guidelines to be in BODS. So I'm not quite sure what information is being passed across to the ones who are doing the chasing, but I think there's a gap in either knowledge or understanding of the requirements. And it would be useful if that was clarified really. Okay, yeah. Um... I believe the policy, uh, um, policy advisor is working on that, but would you mind just to double check to send me an email just outlining that in writing? Um, that would be really helpful so I can uh, make sure I can pass that to the people who are actually calling out. A couple of example operators in might be helpful to, uh, to help sort of them work out which ones should be being invited and which ones shouldn't yeah yeah no problem with that i uh, just need an email for jan then yep this is um, one available do you have my yep i'll set uh yep i'll just put that in the chat okay excellent thank you um any more um the um the next phase of um, the um, routes and timetables work is um, implementing the data validator, um, which has just gone live last night, I think it was, um, or the next the next release of it. Um, and so um, operators will start to see more um, feedback on their data quality um, and it's worth um, encouraging them if they've not looked at it for a few days um, to, to have a look at um, what it's looking like now because it, it, it may be more helpful to them resolve some of those problems. I don't know whether there's anything that you want to say on that Peter or Mike. I think it's, uh, my, I defer to Peter really, because I think he's closer to it than I am. Sorry, Tim, uh, are, are we still on the uh, on the school services or I, was I distracted there by something else? Uh, root, root, roots and timetable and the, the new validator that's been released and the feedback in it. 
Yes, um, well, it, it was released yesterday, was that right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think there's still um, there's still scope possibly for uh, yeah certainly the feedback on it and uh, and to whether it's uh, fine tuned uh, 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 as it as it could be and and what further adjustments might might just make it uh, work well. But certainly there are quite a number of issues in there that need to be um, um, that operators perhaps need to encourage uh, working with their suppliers to uh, to resolve. Some issues, perhaps the operators think it's suppliers, and some issues think it's the supplier. Think it's the operator need to know how to 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 comply. So there's quite a bit of dialogue. It would be would be useful around getting that compliance as soon as possible. Can can I ask what what what, what extra stuff that the validator is doing over and above what was being checked previously? Is it is it is that a, a simple question, or if it's too complicated? Um, you know, ignore it. But is there a summary on that? There's not a summary, I don't think. But I can tell you what I found while I was doing testing for Ticketer, yeah. if that helps. Yeah, it might. If it, yeah, it would help me. If that's OK. Yeah, please. OK, well, there used to be a data quality report only. And yeah. on test, it used to bring up more things than it does on live and it brings up things like non-naptan stops and unfortunately a non-naptan stop gets planted in the silly aisles so it also gives you a warning that your bus is going too fast between two points one in yorkshire and one in the silly aisles um, it then gives you warnings about where it thinks you've missed a stop if one journey pattern goes to a school and the rest don't the rest are flagged as are they missing the school and things like that? Um, and it doesn't like no block. And it tells the operator that their bus won't run next week if they haven't got a block in, which is hopefully it's been modified in the live just to say you need it there by October, which is the agreement that we thought we had with um, DFT. Um, and then separately now you get a PTI observations spreadsheet and the good thing about these things is that they both export so that you can see them now. And the PTI one gives you um, the details of which fields you've got wrong. And mainly it's like the service definition where most of our operators haven't got round to loading up their license numbers yet because we haven't asked them to do it because we're waiting to see what else they need to do for fares. So we can all try and do it in one hit. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, David. Um, one of one of the um, outstanding things for the routes and timetables is is an update to the um, PTI profile document um, because the current issued one's got a few um, uh, little errors in it. Most people that are working with it know what those are um, but the document itself has got a load of bad references into so it references paragraph zero quite a lot and things like that um, there's an update due for that um, in the next couple of weeks um, and that will also include um, information on how the validator is um, testing for that requirement so, for example, um, for uh, something like um, um, oh, what shall we use? Um, schools, um, making sure that the length of the name is is appropriate um, and not too short. You know, you have to provide it. There's no point providing it if it's only a couple of characters long. Um, let's have a realistic length and, and whatever the length is for it. Um, so hopefully that will mean that it's easier for people to, to look at a single document and see what's going on um, and understand what needs to happen. Um, before that gets formally released, the plan is to have um, a session um, going through that document just to make sure that um 
it really does address um, the questions people have still got um, because we don't want to keep on releasing um, the profile document. Um, we want to try and make this one the uh, the last one, um, at least for uh, for a good while yet, allow people to implement and it to settle down. Is it going to have an explanation of Scottish bank holidays then, as well as you can't use school holidays? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's the sort of thing that reason that we want to just talk to make sure it's it's right before we release it by getting the, the people that work with the document on a regular basis to, to cast their eyes over it first. Um, so, uh, so yeah, look out for an invite. Okay. Um, is there anything more on routes and timetables? No. Okay. Location data. Jan, have you got anything more to say about that? Um, I haven't really prepared much for that other than the fact that we've um we we're also at the same time working on the PTI validator, but I'm not too close with the work itself. No. Okay. Um from a profile point of view, a number of you have provided some feedback over the last couple of weeks, which I know is being worked through. Um, and so again, um, in the next few weeks, um, I'd expect uh, an update to um, the um, guidance on that to reflect feedback and, and that sort of thing. Um, I'm less certain of the timescales for that though than the than the uh, trans exchange profile one. I think if Thanks, people sir. are looking at yeah, if, if people are looking at their real time uh, data, it's, it's worth looking at the A board service uh, again um, uh, as of uh, as of now, because uh, we we certainly have got um, uh, tightened up on the um, between the number of estimated journeys and the number actually appearing. It's, it's looking a bit better now, and but um, we're still working on it. Um, but it certainly um, will give more. I think useful and stable results. So it'd be good if people had another look at it if they've already looked at it. Look again, that'd be good. Thank you. Can I, um, can I um, ask a question about the data that's being used in the ABODs for scheduled, please? Um, we had an operator digital initiative meeting um, a couple of weeks ago, and some of the operators are checking what's on ABODs against their own scheduled appearance, and it's way out in some cases. And we've been trying to work out how the matching is done. And, you know, Peter, you say there's been an update and perhaps it has improved. But we believe that some of the scheduled data in ABODs is coming from the TNDS because the operators haven't published their data yet. And if that's still true, then that's probably one of the reasons why the matching isn't working perfectly, because the scheduled data is coming from the local authority without the same references as the data coming from the operator for the VM for the location data. So I think, I really generally, I think when you do your ABODS presentation, it would be really helpful to explain to the local authorities that where you don't have decent data yet from operators, that TNDS is underpinning that, because it does help to explain where there might be some data that's out in the matching. It's just something that seems to have been glossed over, but it is quite important. Yeah, um, there were um, a couple of um, webinars on ABODS. Um, one an hour ago uh, today and one yesterday. Um, and that is something that um, is being highlighted um, to, to people on those calls that where data isn't in um, BODs, then um, until the end of June, um, PNDS data is being used um, so that operators can see something um and and see what's coming for them um, and start to get their head around how they can use a bods that's really helpful thank you because the um the bods team that were on that meeting didn't know that the tnds was being used in a bods and couldn't
couldn't answer the question. So I think joining up the circle here is, has been really helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, right. Um, while we're talking about ABODs, um, ABODs is analysed bus open data. For those of you that aren't aware, sorry, realising that falling into the trap of using acronyms without explaining what they are. Um, <laughs> um, that's the new analyze service that, that sits on top of um, bus open data platform. Um, there's a there's been a couple of launch webinars the last couple of days. There's more in June and some in July as well. Um, you can sign up for those um, through the RTIG Eventbrite page, and, and RTIG's got a special page um, uh, on it um, with all of the different events, and, and the recordings for those will be made available in the next um, few days. So if you couldn't join um, them live, then uh, then you can uh, then you can review them. Okay, um, any more on root um, um, ABODs or live location Tim, data? Tim, you mentioned then about the, the infilling thing. You said up until the end of June. Is there a plan for July? You were talking about, what? sorry, the, the TNDS being used. Uh, I think so, you said up until yeah, at, at that point, then um, the current plan is to remove TNDS data, so it's only um, BODs, oh. routes and timetables data that's used. Okay. Okay, cool, thanks. Okay. Is that bit here? Yes. Yeah, so end of June, like a month. Yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 So just just out of interest, that doesn't mean that that's just TNDS will continue to be populated. You just won't be using it as a as a fallback within BODs for, for a BODs. Is is it yes, or, or that's within right. BODs at all? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I I I don't think Julie's about to stop doing TNDS anytime soon. No, no, no. We'll give you an update, a little quick update on that later on in the travel line update, just so that you know what's happening. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anything else? No. In which case, let's move on to fares then, and the fares module. Um, we've got, it's, I think, I've seen Stephen. Yeah, there we go. Yes. Hello, Stephen. You're going to give us an update on the fares work. Hi, Tim. Yes, I am. Um, let me just see if I can share. Uh, can we all yep. see that? That's working. Great. So this is a presentation I gave to the, the board's program board or the Open Buses program board yesterday. Um, it's quite a fast moving situation, so some of it may be out of date already. Um, I'll try and whiz through it as quick as I can. So, um, I mean, a lot of this you've already seen from uh, Jan's presentation. As you can see, um, you know, but the fares data at the moment is lagging far behind sort of all the success that's been achieved with Trans Exchange and uh, Siri VM. Um, over 900 data sets of 40, 40 operators, as you saw. Most of that data has been supplied by smaller operators. Um, the majority of it at the moment has been created in the Create Fares data service with a couple of operators supplying um, data sets from their ticketer system. Uh, and a lot of the data sets on it are really just fragmented and actually only represent a handful of products rather than a comprehensive um, data set. Um, so looking forward for the rest of the year, um, we're expecting um, operators to be supplying NetEx from uh, VIX and Ticketer and the Create Fares data service. At the moment, um, there's no, no news of Init or Flowbird um, offering that um, functionality for their Clients. So we're expecting operators on those systems like the National Express West Midlands 
um, to supply their NetEx using the Great Bears Day, Day service for the time being. Um, just to quickly whiz over, you know, as we know, there's been a bit of a, a block here you know, with the supply of NetEx. Uh, that some of the, the big operators were concerned that NetEx didn't accurately reflect the sort of complexity of point-to-point -point fares. Um, I'll just quickly um, go through one sort of, I mean, there's, there's quite a few scenarios where there were problems, but I mean, I'll just whiz through one quickly that I um, did for the board yesterday. So, uh, you know, reading, I guess, the documentation, I've seen this sort of samples that have been produced by the Create Fares Data Service, um, sort of idea of fares on as a group stops and then a, a fares fare on as another group stops representing stages and a price between the two is not necessarily an accurate reflection of the price and actually uh, the sort of the point in the stage that the alighting and boarding stops are also affects the price. Uh, this little graphic at the bottom sort of illustrating that, you know, on the traditional um, just zone to zone structure um, that the Create Fares Data Service is using, this second row would be priced one to two and the third row would also be priced one to two, but actually because one's later, stop in the stage actually it's a price one to three so you know the uh, the, the ticket machine suppliers were i guess looking for um a solution to this within the profile um this is an example of i guess a solution to that problem um that within netex you can create um fair zones for boarding and the lighting so you know as long as you've got a stop uh, that's in uh, you know, every stop will need to be in both a boarding and a lighting fare zone for it to work properly. Um, but once you've done that, um, you can then put a distant, you know, distant matrix element with a price where you have an alighting fare zone and a um, boarding fare zone that are different. So you can see here in this sample, the, uh, you know, the ledger center, boarding and alighting is actually the same in that case, whereas just as a center, the boarding stage is far bigger than the alighting stage. And that these stops that you don't see um, in the alighting stage will actually be another lighting stage further down the file. So that's that's sort of an illustration of the, the things that have been blocking um, ETM suppliers sort of um, spitting out the data um, as much as we want. So there are still, I guess, a few sort of things outstanding um, in the sort of supply fares data, you know, things like cap products, because, you know, I guess we need to think about what information that we need to capture and supply to downstream users of the data. Uh, Multi-operator tickets, which is really more about, um, you know, who's responsible for supplying the data for multi-operator tickets rather than how they should be structured in NetEx, that's quite clear. Um, through fares, uh, you know, including circulars, complex routes, forks and stuff. So that's really just about how these are gonna be expressed in NetEx, um, you know, uh, in a similar fashion across all the suppliers. Subscription-based products, the same, you know, continuous payment authority, how we represent that. And then there's obviously a publication format, which is important. So, you know, do we have big files? Do we have um, one file per product, et cetera? Um, Bix and Ticket have got a slightly different approach at the moment. So, you know, do we need to sort of align those better to make it easier to consume the data downstream? Um, so the next steps are, I mean, we, We've received sort of test data sets from Stagecoach for Vivix um, for the Stagecoach South division. You know that's been reviewed. Uh, the quality of the data is generally good, and you know it's you know with a few additions, it's it's basically ready for publishing already. And Stagecoach are looking to publish their entire networks um, fares data set in the next few weeks. So that's that's England, Scotland, and Wales. And for Ticketer, they already have uh, the functionality there for. Um, their clients to, to export NetEx if they want. But I mean, obviously with the first stage issue not quite resolved, that's really for operators who have sort of simpler fare structures. Um, as I mentioned, a couple have already done that um, to the BOS platform. I think it's Trent Barton and Reading Bus, if I remember correctly. Um, but we, we, we have supplied um, examples and advisory notes on the, the, the first stage issue, how to resolve it to Ticketer. And they'll be looking to um, implement a resolution, I guess in the next few weeks. I mean, I think tickets are on call so they can probably clarify that later if, if needs be. Just to move on to the other source of fares at the moment, the Create Fares Data Service. So, you know, we did discovery on, on that service um, in April, looking at, you know, the sort of products that are missing in the functionality, uh, particularly things that have been in, in the National Bus Strategy that's published in March. So we've got a roadmap you can see there at the bottom, you know, so in the next three months, we want to be building features that allow Operators to define carnet products, cap fares, plus bus and hopper style tickets. 
that'll really sort of sweep up the kind of remaining products that were asked for in the legislation. Um, and one other thing that the Create Fair Service, you know, I think the feedback is very, very much, while it is simple to understand the, the Fair Service um, and simple to use, it's actually quite difficult if you're trying to create lots of products to try and manage large data sets. It's a very tedious experience. So we're going to introduce something called, well, I mean, the mock, that's a mock-up at the moment. It's called MyFairs, a bit of a 2005 name. Uh, it might not be called MyFairs in the end. Um, it's just a, a sort of concept at the moment. But really, it's just a data management hub that will allow um, bus operators to, to do things like global settings, you know, so you can set what, what an adult is or what your off peak is to, to to avoid having to repeat that process every time you create a new product. And then the ability to bulk export your data sets and configure the, the exports and edit existing products. So, you know, if you've got just a small change, like a price increase, you can do that with a few clicks rather than redefining the product. So that's what we'll be uh, looking to develop over the next few months to make, make sure the Create Fairs Data Service can offer at least approximating a same level of functionality as say VIX and Ticket are for their clients. Uh, the next steps in general uh, for the Create Fair service is to work with operators on Init and Flowbird, try and you know um, optimize the product for their use. Obviously, particularly one thing we're just looking at is the bulk import of existing fair data in spreadsheets or whatever that uh, may make the job a lot easier for operators. And more generally, um, once VIX and Ticketer start to publish this data on the BOS platform more regularly, um, we'll be conducting user research with downstream data users because obviously NetEx is a novel data standard. Fares and Ticketing is very, you know, it's a very diverse thing across the industry. So the, the data is going to be far more complex in Trans Exchange and Siri to deal with. So I guess we need to to engage with the downstream users to make, to, to make sure it gets used because I think you know it, it may just put people off the difficulty. So there'll, there'll be a there'll be a user research piece in July, August time, depending on you know the rest of the work that's going on in BODS. So I think that's uh, the end of the presentation and um, where we are with fairs. If anybody's got any questions, uh, Stephen, if I may, it's Nick Carey from Wayfair. Um, how does this work with the BSIP? Because DFT obviously is, uh, you know, uh, promoting the rollout of the BSIP, and that has an extensive requirement to report on operator fares, granular data on single operator fare volumes for single fares, etc. Uh, but the the timetable of this doesn't seem to sort of square with the fact that the BSIP has got to be live by 31st of October this year. Uh, well, I mean, you know, this is this fares data is around, um, you know, the, it's it's for information for passengers mainly. Um, if you're talking about measuring the volumes of tickets that are being sold, then that's not what this data is is being designed no. for. No, 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 not at all. It's it's a requirement in the bus bus serv DFT's bus service operator improvement plan for anyone that is doing that plan one of the requirements in there is to report on the granular data uh, on single operator fare volumes for single fares, flat fares, such as youth or hopper fares, period passes. You know, it's just a whole raft of stuff. Um, but it, it, I, I can't see that the data is going to be available to do that. So, when you say volumes, what do you mean by volumes? Well, this is DFT's own definition. Um, that is, that's that, Nick, as I understand it, is the number of products sold uh, of each of each type to keep track of um, whether people are getting ostensibly best value from tickets. So if, if an operator is selling, you know, a thousand single tickets and not selling any returns or period products, right. then that should flag up something that actually, you know, they're right. not promoting something or, you know, that there, there needs to be some more products introduced that are more value for for operators. So it's more it's volumetric, whereas the fares for BODS is about providing the ability for people in effect to plan a journey and know how much it's going to cost in advance that's fundamentally what it yeah yeah, yeah. Out yeah to I, I i get it i mean but the the two are surely linked um and and thanks for the clarification but uh the two are surely linked because these things are dynamic i mean um 
the BSIT requires that to be monitored. It's not like a static thing because a fair will, that they may uh, introduce a new fair or a new structure or whatever. So those, those, those fair volumes by, by type are going to change through time. Uh, all I really need to know is where, where the authority who's signed up to the BSIP gets that data from. That would have to be from an operator because they're the only ones that would know the the volume of sale because the fair service, I've never seen any plans for it to hold volumetric sales data. Um, no, I mean, that, that, that's how the scope of what we're doing for sure. I'm, I'm sure one um, could reverse engineer it back out of the, the NetEx because you could actually get volumes. It, it's just that given that if you say it's up to operators, then how does the authority make sure that the operator is is reporting correctly? Because if it's if they're marking their own homework, is there a risk that they'll just forget to do it or it won't happen or whatever? So if they are simply the sole source of where that data comes from, then there's surely a risk that they they just they don't update it or whatever. It just remains static. And the BSIPS yes, that says, yes, that's all fine, when in fact it's not like that at all. I'm not quite sure what you're expecting the fares service to, to do. I, I yeah, just see them as linked, but maybe they're not. Yeah, well, you're a bit surely you're confusing two different things here. You, you've got the definitions of the fares, which is what this the fair projects is all about. It's about coming up with structured definitions of the fares and the prices that can be exchanged in uh, computer machine readable format and used for different purposes. And then you've got the actual transaction data that is generated by people buying those fares. Mm -hmm. um, which, if you summarize and analyze, would give you the kind of information it sounds like you want for BSEPs. But that transact, you know, to um, generate, store, transmit, and analyze all that transaction data is a huge thing. I mean, there are how many two billion bus journeys in London or something a year? I mean, uh, so you, you, you can't just expect to be, you know, handed to you on a plate. Um, it would need a considered plan to sure um, no i i get, get that Nick. i just i just wonder where the the authority goes for that but but seemingly they just ask the bus operator and the bus operator gives them the volumes and it's job done yeah i mean i thought the only realistic thing for now is for them to be summarizing their data internally and giving you those summaries um mm -hmm. but uh if you want in in i mean in in theory that the, the what you in order to do what you're the kind of thing you're talking you know if you want to have a third party independently verifiable you'd have to get them to give you the raw transaction data and have a service to summarize it yourself which yeah which yeah not cost effective for <laughs> fractions of you know a few, a few pennies unless ticketer has a route through to this because they where they are operating and where they've got the ticket machines they may they may be able to do the aggregation who knows? Anyway, I, I've, I've taken us down a rabbit hole. I, I will step back. Apologies. Okay. I think John Carr wants to chip in. Yeah, I, I was going to say, Nick, um, I'm sorry, not Nick, um, uh, Tim, that the uh, I think Nick is right. It's a very difficult position that we're all in. Uh, I would say that I see the work that's being done on fairs at the moment as being the same sort of work as... Uh, Nick and I were once involved in on the fares exchange project. Um, and I think there, there's enough complexity because if you're advising the public of fares, do you say, here's the single fare point to point, or do you perhaps say, well, as you're presumably going on from there or coming back, you'd be better off considering this other type of ticket. You know, there's a whole gray area there. But in terms of the BSIP, I think there's an awful lot of material that the department appears to be expecting to be available by October, which I would say, looking at it, there's not a cat in hell's chance that you're going to be able to get much of that. You know, much, I don't mean in quantity, but 
some of it just won't be in a state to be reported yet. And therefore, I think we have to have, as ATCO, uh, a meeting with DFT to go through these things and to get some further, perhaps informal guidance on how far we need to go. But I, I know that certain DFT team members have said at this stage, the end of June and the end of September, evidence that you're actually beavering away at it will be good enough, end of October rather, will, will be good enough. It's really the um, end of year date that they want to see concrete progress. I don't know if that helps or whether it just introduces another level it, of complication. It, it does. Uh, <laughs> just don't ask a question about fares as I think the answer. <laughs> it's just too enormous a subject, but that's really helpful, actually. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that back to the ACTO board. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, any more on fares? Hi, Tim. I have a question for Stephen. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Stephen. Um, on the more developer side of this, um, I think... Well, there's two points I picked up from your presentation. I think the first one was the um, that there's going to be user research into using NetX. Um, I think that probably should have come earlier on because understanding what, what I understand of the NetX format is very complicated. It's worse than Trans Exchange. I think for developers in general, it's going to be a very hard um, up, uphill battle to understand what's happening there. Um, so is there any consideration to uh, producing a simpler format there for developers to use. Um, that's my first question. And the second question I have is around making the actual fares simpler. So as PTEC and probably from DFT, there's an opportunity here for us to help guide operators um, for them to produce simpler fares. And it's something that we try and do at Passenger. I know you mentioned Reading. And that's probably one of the companies we've worked with quite a lot with trying to make the fares easier and and simpler to understand for the user because ultimately is what we see is we have operators who have a fare structure that probably works for them internally but doesn't necessarily work for the user and there needs to be a focus on the user here i think with a lot of this yeah i mean with reference to your first point um you know, we, we have tried to do user research before on net on consuming NetX. Quite simply, mm -hmm. the, the, the developers were talking to, uh, it was a, a long-term, um, you know, priority for them. The, 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 at the time, they were just far too concerned with, you know, far more, I'm not so it makes them sound accusatory. They were just more concerned with, you know, getting the, 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 the route and timetable data in and the Serie VM data in, understandably. So they were, they were wrestling with that, really, and just didn't have the time to spare to really think about the NetX because it is very complicated. Um, so that's why I guess the research is research is going to start now because one we have large amounts of netex to give um, operators and you know they've obviously progressed a lot on the work they've done on trans exchange and Siri so yeah the timing is more auspicious I guess yeah um, I mean in terms of a simpler data format that's not been discussed yet. I mean, obviously, one of the things we, we often hear back is we want we want GTFS. Um, mm. But obviously, GTFS is not in a position at the moment where it can, uh, you know, accurately reflect half the things that are asked for in the statute regulations affairs. Mm. So it's really a non-starter at the moment. That's probably, again, a more, a more long-term aspiration. Um, yeah, in I terms mean, of fair simplification, that's so sorry, Nick, I'll let you go first. Before sorry, I guess. So, add in a couple of comments uh, on that. I mean, I, I, I certainly accept that NetX is, you know, a pretty complex to learn and, and study, but that it's, it is kind of inherent in the domain because even the, even if you can sort of get by with basic product, as in a simple standalone basic product definitions, the way that um, people, the companies for, you know, sound business reasons combine and, and come up with co combination products. And, and we're seeing it even more now with cap, things like capped multimodal products becoming more widely available. Yeah, you, you really can't represent 
all that happens simply. And remember, our, our goal here is not just to have the prices, which is really all GTFS does. It has the prices, but it doesn't, GTFS doesn't precisely say what it is that you're pricing. Um, you know, it doesn't even really describe the user types, yet alone all the other thing, other conditions that apply to FES. So it is a complex domain. And um, the, I think the, the reality is the only way of addressing that is to have a sort of small atomic components that you can combine in different ways. The two ways I think we can make it simpler are one, by trying to restrict the ways we allow to allow the components to be combined quite severely, which is what we've done in the profile. Um, it, I think at the moment slightly too severely as there's some things which we're having to um, use additional features to, to cover to cover all the UK cases. And the other, um, the, the other thing of course we should be doing and this is happening quite a lot now there's a, in Europe with some developing of materials to explain stuff there. This is kind of a better training stuff for developers to explain the concepts and how the stuff works. And, uh, actually at the end of the day the, a uh, it's a regular fare is, has got no more pieces or is no more complicated than a trans exchange um, a, a, or a, a, you know a, a, a timetable representation. Um, it's just that it's a, uh, this whole this the whole of idea of having a general purpose um, standard for fares is 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 really new. Um, one that's one way you're aiming not just to have the prices but also to describe the conditions and the rules. For it, so uh, I, I think I, where I you know, agree with you even more is that it's important for us to develop better uh, training material and better examples um, to help people get into it. Um, yeah, and the, the, I think the easiest way to get the simpler data is just to have simple fares. <laughs> but um, you know that's not um, you know that's in the national bus strategy. Uh, yes. So it's, it's obviously part of the department's aspiration. How exactly that's going to be delivered? Um, you know, I'm not in a position to say at this point. Mm. No, that's fair. Could I just ask a question about the, sorry, Alex, um, it's difficult with no hands um, up for Cincy on here. Um, can I just ask a question, Stephen? I know that the um, Infinity Works product, which is the first tool, was designed to use the TNDF because it was pre any data being available from operators. And now it's been novated to bots. There is a plan for it to stop using TNDF for the scheduled data and start using BODS. Has that happened or is there a timeline for that? There isn't a timeline. What we did is we just built a feature where a user can define which data source they prefer to use, TNDS or BODS, at the moment. So that's, that's how it's running. Yeah, they can use both at the moment, yeah. Um, because obviously we had some issues with maybe um, school operators who, who didn't have any data in TNDS but wanted to create fares. So we needed to add bods to it because obviously then they could go off and use that the, that, that spreadsheet trans exchange creator uh, and upload it and then build the fares off the back of that so yeah we're just giving the option to do both and that's i mean it's not a major priority for us to switch off a, a, any function or change that no, like, i'm not sure so much switching off it's just um con data consumers so you know travel line will take the data from netex from bods at some point but we'll want to know which scheduled data to match it with Will we be matching it, you know, when we're presenting it in our own information system? So if it's been built on TNDS, we'll use the TNDS scheduled data as our base data for services. And if it's been built on the operator data, we'll match the operator timetable data for what I mean. So knowing which data set has been used to match the fares against would be helpful to have as a as a you know in the audit process. Yeah. I mean I think it's something we need to look at. And it's you know, one thing that has kind of um, you know, it's been a bit of a thing that I'm trying to work out is um obviously you know, we need to include for singles and returns. We want to be including proper line data that relates to the trans exchange. Um, and obviously, the PTI profile has has that sort of built in, but the PTI profile there isn't there at the moment. So there's a lot of our line IDs coming through from both TNDS and BODs that are not really that useful. Um, so yeah, I think when we solve the line ID issue, we'll be looking at maybe a source data issue as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, any more questions for Stephen? No? Okay, in which case, let's move on to uh, Naptan project, um, the other major um, DFT piece of work that's going on. 
and in typical fashion, it's going to come about the same time as the parcel that I'm waiting for. So if I need to run, it's just because I need to run to the door. My apologies, <laughs> people. It's that timing issue. Um, if you came to Travel Line the other week, you'll probably recognise what I'm about to do. So feel free to just close your eyes and fall asleep if you were at Travel Line. I think there's a little bit of new information, but not much. Let me just quickly attempt to share my screen on this. Uh, that screen there, can I actually share an application? Oh, that would yeah. be much useful. Thank you. Ah, got it. Sorry, I was muttering to myself. So hopefully you can see um, this. What I'll also do is yes. I'll press enter in the chat eventually, and you'll all also have access to go in and go through the um, mural board as well. Um, so, where are we? Uh, I don't need to do an introduction to Napton because I think everyone's here has been through that so many times. Um, we've expanded a little bit on who uses it just to include, um, I've called it CODS, Coach Open Data Service. It's not, it's NCDS. Um, we understand that we need to co connect up with the sea ferries, the rail, uh, tram metro and airports as well because we know that there are data sets that we need to start to include in there. And we're also aware of new types of systems that might need to come into NAPTAN that we need to be aware of. Um, where we are in terms of scope and plan, uh, we've just finished Horizon 1 and we're getting ready to go into, um, into our private beta and I'll talk about that in a moment and we're currently working on horizon two which is um, we're going to iteratively start to release and that is around identity verification authentication permissions uh, and upload and that will allow us to have both systems running at the same time and that's very important to being able to build a migration plan um, you'll notice that we've got a block here called release three, what's next? This is something that we're just trying to figure out at the moment um, with DFT. We're trying to figure out what has the right um, bite, the right level of funding and what people are needing. So we're just doing some research there. Um, there is a little bit of bite for an API. We want to look at some data quality. There's some real pressure to switch off the old site. Um, we need to understand whether or not we need to move MPTG across. Um, there's a lot around accessibility that needs to come across. Um, there's the possibility of doing some schema changes um, and we want to make sure that there's funding so that the weight of this doesn't all fall unfunded on the um, local transport authorities. And there's the, um, visualization and how stops map and we just had a really interesting discussion with street maps uh, street mapping street manager this morning about some ideas for that we're heading towards this glorious vision of all of these systems talking to each other using some sort of APIs and them all being lovely integrated and talking and when you make a mistake in one that will impact another and things like that, these things will be alerted. That's a wonderful, glorious vision that will come around. Um, most of the public, we did a lot of public meetings, as uh, Tim said, between January and March. And what we've uncovered here is just a little bit of what we've found. I'm not gonna run through it in any kind of massive way. I think one of the big take home points was um, the stop CSV files, where this has meant one of the things that we have stopped doing in the new system is doing any data processing. So the raw data that comes in from the local authorities is presented out the other end in either an XML or CSV format. Now, what this has meant is we've uncovered places where the current NAPTAN has been doing some work to take data out or manipulate data um, or change data. And those are the things that we're uncovering at the moment. So if you're a local authority and we contact you, we're not saying your data is bad. We're just saying for some reason, uh, 
old NAP10 or current NAP10 and new NAP10 are disagreeing and we've found this processing error and we're trying to trace down exactly what's going on. Is it a mistake on our side? Is it something that we should be doing? Um, and just trying to understand that. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I can't see any faces either. I can only see the app that I'm presenting. So I wouldn't, I, I, I hate to say I miss teams, but I'm missing teams right now. Um, communications we've got planned. Uh, we've done March and April in May. We've pretty much done May as well. So we sent out a comms email with uh, some updates on the responsible, what we meant by responsible and some June, July plans. We then sent out another comms email with all the NAPTAN meetings that Tim kindly helped us set up. And we held the LTA responsible meeting where we had 50 people turn up and it went down to about 47 and stayed at about 46, 47 for most of the meeting, which is amazing given that it was a bit of a trudge in places. Um, we've got, so we're working on improving some of that. We've got um, another meeting coming up in June, and I can't remember the date, but I can share that out in a mo. Um, we've got two more coming up in July, and we're planning some more for August. And in August, we're going to start talking about migration planning. We're predicting by then that we will have enough functionality that we can start to plan out what needs to happen for the migration. And this will enable us to talk to DFT and to talk to you all about exactly what's going to happen. And when I say talk to DFT is digital services within DFT, we need to talk to the various moving parts of and other areas of DFT to get the funding. We're like a little shared service. Um, meanwhile, meanwhile, we're trying to find out who's responsible for the data. Now, you might say you're running a service currently how can you not know who's uploading? Um, it's quite possible because these accounts are being shared across people. We've only got contacts. We know that some of the account names that we've got for some locations, the person's actually left and they just handed over the account because administration of accounts has been so difficult in the current system. So it's not a bad thing. You've Everyone's had to work around the system. What we're trying to do is go and just make sure that we know who the people are. We've got that verification that we've got the right people. Um, we're also working through having a look at timelines and making sure that this is matching up to people's expectations. I will pause for a two second breath before I launch on into showing you where things are at and talking about the public, the public, um, the private beta, if anyone has any questions. I just wanted to ask what, when, when is the, I, I'm not trying to promote this, but is the ETO world tool still, still going to be carry, carrying on for the foreseeable future? Um, so what we're trying to do is understand what the, not what it does, because we know that it's functions. We're trying to understand how it fits into the ecosystem, look at those and look at how we can put that into our system. And that we've got on our plan, just let me get my mouse into the right place and scroll back. On our plan, we've called that, um, there's two parts to that. One is the data quality which is around the business rules that are applied. And the other one is around the visualization of the maps and stops. So we think we can do some parts without doing the other. And we're just trying to pull it apart. In the meantime, Ito World will continue to be, um, support, will continue to be there until we've got our migration plan in place. And Ito World is part of our migration plan. Does that make sense? And does that answer the question? Yeah, so it's very likely that the sort of initial six months is, is going to be exceeded quite a bit for the ETO world to carry uh, on. I wouldn't, I'd say it's going to be exceeded, but I don't know by how much. And I wouldn't, wouldn't say by quite a bit. It'd probably be at least another, well, no, I can't. I'm not allowed to say numbers. I'm a VA. VAs don't get to give promises or numbers at all. Okay, all right. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it will be there until we have replaced until we have replaced its functionality. But it might not look exactly like the current Neto world, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Cool. Um, just to give you an idea of where we're headed, um, 
I'm going to show you a prototype, which is a clip through prototype. I don't think you're going to be able to get to it from what I've shared out. And I'll also show you the current system of where we're at. So you can get a sense of what what we've developed today and where we and what we're developing for tomorrow. So if I go to this thing here, this is what it's starting to look like. And you can access the national stop data or the stop data by local authority. So we're trying to make it really clear what somebody's going to get when they come to download NAMP10. So this is just the download journey. Um, I'll just go through the stop data by local authorities because this is the one that a lot of people get. A, it's, it's, let's be honest, it's the sexier version. The other one is just download a file. This is download the specific file that I'm after. So we've set this up so that when you search for a local authority, you can search by the name, the region or the ACTO code, and all three of those will work. So it's making it much easier and much faster to find what you're after. Uh, I can't remember where I need to click. There we are. And then I click on add, and then I can choose what format I get it in and click on download. So we've tried to make it so much easier than the current system, um, so much more visible of what you're doing. Um, and let me see if I can remember how to get back because it's a clickable prototype I've got to remember, uh, and downloading the national stop data. This is essentially what we've got on our live system. So this is what we've currently developed. Um, one of the things that we're doing is doing all the data quality checks to make sure that when we give you a file, it's exactly what it should be. There's no missing pieces or duplicated stops or anything like that. I can accept the analytics cookies. I can hide the message. And then when I click download, I will be downloading the full uh, NAPTAN file. You can see I've downloaded that at least five times in the last week. Um, I clear out my downloads file. So that's giving me um, stops.csv nationally. So what we're trying to do is also look at what was inside that stop CSV, that CSV zip file that, that you were getting. Because when we did some analysis, we found that at least one of the files has not worked for a very long time, was not containing the expected data. It was not containing any data. Um, and when you go and try to get that data manually, it gives you some of that data, but not all of the data that should be in that file. So we're, um, I don't know if anyone's reported this. I'm sure you must have. I'm sure somebody else has noticed this, but this is why we're going through file by file on those CSV files to make sure that they're exactly what they should be, but also they're what you need and what you're using. So this is part of that schema change of like, are we going to give you the right data? Uh, flicking back to here, and I'll stop for a breath in a second. Looking back to the right place. Um, what's coming up with the private beta? Um, there are four key cycles that, that, that we're looking at. There's the upload. So that's getting the file in. We currently take this from, um, we're taking this from current NAPTAN. So that upload system that everyone's using and everyone's been using for a long time, that we don't have to change that at the moment for us to validate that file, output it and allow you to download it. So we can, we've tried to decouple everything as much as possible so that we can get the quality and try downloading files and get your feedback on what works before we go and try and build some of the other, we try and build the update, the upload part of the system. Um, so we want to improve the speed of, of the output. We can currently take an uploaded file, process it and have it ready to download within five minutes. Um, we're trying to look at can we keep that speed consistent? If there's error messages, how should we display them to you? What are the best ways of letting you know what's going on? And we can do some of that with the current way that we're working. Because if you're uploading to current NAP10, we can try and process it and go, mm, we think there might be a problem here if you try to look at the file in new NAP10. Um, what, what data do you actually need? Can we remove redundant data? We know that there are some fields especially in the CSV files that aren't being used. Um, like clearing code apparently is based on an old system that isn't needed for anything. So we could literally stop producing that field. 
and this will make our system a little bit greener because it's data we don't need to store, it's data we don't need to send out. Um, can we improve the download experience and can we make the site more robust? Um, so speaking of robustness, this has been one of the things that's uh, slowed us slightly over the last time that we talked. Um, we're running a pen test or a pen security penetration test. So we've got some testers coming in to try and break the site to see if they can get in behind the front door and bust it up and graffiti it and do whatever they want. So we're just running it through that. That goes on the 1st of June, I think it's booked in for, and we'll find out what changes we need to make before we can go and make this private beta, I hate to say this, the private beta page public. If that's not a tongue twister, uh, the private beta page public um, once we've passed this test and made and fixed any red flags that come up. Um, all of, the pri all of the people we're inviting to the first tranche, that first set of private beta users, they've all been invited, and I know some of them are on this call, um, and we've got meetings with them on the 8th and the 10th of June. So we're gonna go through the site, its current state by that time. We've got another two weeks of development. I know that there's some more stuff that's gonna change on the site over the next couple of days. So I'll be able to talk people through that. Um, that's pretty much it from us at Naptan. So I will take breath, I'll stop sharing. And um, any questions? Any questions for Dr. I have Jay? Some questions, Dr. Jay. I noticed in oh, your- hi, Alex. Hello, Dr. Jay. I noticed in your demo that um, there is a button to press to download the data set. Is there going to be a provision to provide a link like we currently do on the Naptan website? So, um, for example, with us, where we import machine to machine, so we, we yep. fetch data um, with interacting with the web page. So you're effectively creating an API without calling it an API by doing this by doing this processing. Yes, we've considered that. So what you press on for the download, we're looking at how to make sure that. It, once you've chosen what you want to download and you, and, and you choose that, you can copy and use that URL. So we've okay. done some testing on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I believe you're part of the, the private beta group. So if there mm -hmm. is stuff in there that we need to adjust and help you with, that's part of why you were one of the people that I looked at and said, I think we need that person on our team. Yeah, okay. Thank you. No problems. I don't want to, I, what, what we're trying to do with the private beta, by the way, is to get people to use the new Naptan, not just use it once or twice and go, yeah, yeah, it's fine. We want to get people to use it proper, proper like, like change to it, use it for a couple of weeks and then tell us where they've run into problems because it's only by using it on a day-to-day -day basis and those things that some of those little fine details are going to come up and those are the things because we don't want to cause pain we're trying to remove as much pain from naptan as possible dr j uh, as the person that had naptan on my list at dft i'm blown away um i i, I may have to regret <laughs> my words but i think it's awesome what you've what you've done oh, thank is, you. is extraordinary it's it's such an improvement Oh, thank you so much. I will let all of the users, I will let the team know they'll be absolutely stoked <laughs> to hear that. Thank you, Nicholas. That, that, that really does mean a lot. It's a pleasure. Okay. I was, gonna, I, was, I was just going to second what Alex had said uh, about, I, I, I like the ability to be able to just have a URL so that you can just, whatever, whatever it is, plug in plug in that mm -hmm. URL and, and download Leicester and Leicestershire and Rutland or whatever it was. It, I don't do it very yeah. often, but I like to be able to do that. just pick something I've always have that option without having to go through the pain of downloading as uh, as Alex so sort of. So I can see you're trying to simplify it, but if you can keep those those shortcut uh, for for people who, who, who just use it occasionally and don't want to have to um, le learn spend too much time then that that will be good as well so this is there's sort of two 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 edges that i saw if you like yeah that's part of what we also want to do is to understand the way that you're using it and see if there's even easier ways that we can make this for you 
Um, so if there are ways that 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 we can store it, if there are ways that that we can enable you to build the four or five different things you download and just go, I want that one today, that's going to be a whole lot easier than trying to, and I know you're pulling out, you're going to have to change your URLs. Whatever I do, there is no way I can keep your URLs as they were. That's all right. That's, in all, the old that's all right. That's all right. We don't mind that. <laughs> that's okay. Thanks. So, so, and, and and that changing, there might be some little tweaks that that we can do to make those URLs even easier for you to use. Yeah, that's fine. That's great. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Joe. For that update, Sweet. that was great. Um, so next we've got accessible information regulations. Um, so that's me. Um, so um, some of you will have seen some of this um, before. Um, but um, just to go back in hi history now, Bus Service Act um allows the dft to uh, require operators to provide audio and visual announcements on vehicle um the consultation response well the consultation took place in 2018 um and the response isn't out yet but those of you that are eagle eyed um will have spied some dates in the bus strategy and we'll come on to that um, linked to the Bus Service Act, um, the um, DFT launched um, uh, 18 months ago a campaign called It's Everyone's Journey um, to encourage people to be um, considerate of people with disabilities and accessibility needs. Um, and um, they've just relaunched that this week. So you'll have seen a flurry of this uh, signpost in tweets and uh, and LinkedIn posts and things like that from um, all sorts of people. Um, but to support that, every it's it's everyone's journey and um, the um, um, information um, requirements. Um, there's a grant which we've talked about here for small operators uh, to encourage them uh, to adopt uh, audio visual on vehicle equipment in advance of regulation um, and uh, and that was paused because of the pandemic um, small operators were more worried about whether they were going to be running a service or not um, tomorrow rather than um, Having to uh, to apply for, for for grants and things for for kit, so that was paused. Um, and it's about to become unpaused, so you'll start to see more about the grant in the coming months. Um, but for the eagle-eyed of you, um, there's been a few um, recent announcements about audiovisual information. So um, in the bus strategy, um, it reminds people. Um, of what was in the Bus Service Act. Um, and um, it actually says that they'll get the um, regulations um, out by summer 2022. So uh, in about a year's time. Um, and um, they have increased the uh, grant for equipment by um, another million and a half. So that grant is now going to be three and a half million, um, which should allow for um, a very good proportion of small uh, bus operators to get funding for it. Um, and um, it also announced in there that buses that are funded or part funded by government grants um, are going to have to have space for a second wheelchair user or passengers with push chairs. So not just one wheelchair space, which is the um, uh, minimum um, requirement for uh, accessible vehicles, um, but also um, hearing loops. Um, so hearing aid loops, the T-switch type 
um, systems and uh, audio and visual information. So if you've got government funding for a vehicle, then you're going to have to provide that. And that was backed up by um, the Zebra announcement, um, the Zero Emissions Bus Scheme, which um, went into a bit more detail about what was going to be expected. So um, as we've talked about here before, um, what the route is, each upcoming stop and diversion information, um, doing that on um, using at least one screen on uh, each deck um, and the lower deck screen visible from all priority seats. So that sort of area at the front where you've got um, the wheelchair spaces and um, um, priority seating, that's that, that sort of area. Um, people are gonna have to hear the announcements um, on the decks, including um, in the priority spaces and um, induction loops in that priority seating area, recognises that actually to, re I mean, this, this is about new buses, the Zebra scheme, but this is in recognition of um, when these same requirements start to apply to non-new vehicles. Um, it's actually really quite hard to fit um, induction loop systems into um, existing vehicles. So allowing that to be limited to just priority seats in the wheelchair space. Um, and also um, a second loop. So that loop in the priority seats and wheelchair space um, should repeat what's being um, fed through the PA system um, to, to people. So that's next stop information. Um, a second loop to overcome the um, the, the barrier that's, that's appeared during COVID, the perspex screens that have gone up um, and um, masks and things like that. So uh, a loop system to help drivers and passengers who are boarding uh, communicate more effectively. Um, as well as, um, as it said in the strategy, to wheelchair spaces. So um, there's more detail being formally announced. Um, and so um, pending the formal regulations actually being issued, it's not unreasonable to expect um, the requirements that are in the Zebra scheme um, to um, be what's going to have to be applied to uh, existing vehicles. Um, and so um, we're now starting work um, as Artig with the DFT to work through um, with um, suppliers, what solutions are available. Um, and um, there's a working group looking at um, audio visual systems on bus to provide um, some advice and guidance for people, um, uh, being aware that most small operators don't have expert teams in these systems. Um, and so they're going to need some form of uh, support. Um, trying to encourage integration so you don't have um, yet another set of uh, SIM cards and GPS units and things like that. Um, and um, working with people to, to alert them to the fact that actually they're going to have a significant number of um, customers knocking on their door um, because um, they're telling us that um, it takes nearly as much work for an operator with half a dozen vehicles um, to, to get them over the over the line and work through um, what it's going to take to fit vehicles and things like that than it is if one of the big five knock on their door. Fitting's a different matter, of course, but that pre-sales work, um, there's not there's not much difference in, in, in the volume. And when you've suddenly got a lot of people knocking on the door at the same time, um, it's always helpful to have um, some of that um, early warning um, and also to make sure that people are ready to provide support on an ongoing basis um, because on bus kit um, rapidly gets out of date with data and stops working effectively. 
So uh, there's going to be, need to be ongoing support mechanisms for it. Um, and um, I think we're going to need to do a bit more about standardization of information to customers. Um, we did some work with PTIC um, uh, a while ago now on stop names, but uh, th there's likely to be some more uh, needs to standardize some of the other bits of information and provide guidance. Um, so that's the update um, for um, accessible um, information. Anybody got any questions on that? Dr. J. I was just going to say with the stop names and we're working with the with the team who were talking about accessibility because they want to hold the data in that tan and we are trying to work with them to ensure that we've got that as a business rule but also that we do it in a way that causes as little extra work for as many of the local authorities as possible so we're just trying to work with them I just wanted to let you know that's also why there's an upcoming meeting called names and what's yeah. in the name because we we're just making sure that we've got the total understanding of that and everyone's kind of understanding how how some of the names are because we found a whole pile of bus stops just called school might make things a bit tricky yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely julie yeah, my I just want to throw in there, but that's why it's so important to the NPTG data there, because the rules for creating a bus stop name is you qualify it with the uh, locality. So, um, so if, if it's you could therefore have you know school Newport, school Farnham, or, or wherever the lo locality is. Um, the, the name isn't just the common name; it's the indicator, the common name, and the locality. I totally understand and one of the things we're also looking at is there's we've there's another locality system that we might start to look at which is used by the mapping one of the mapping softwares so we're just starting to look at that this is why we've got a big piece coming up called schema change because we need to look at some of the stuff do we continue maintaining nubtig when there's also another locality service that's also maintained by the mapping system. So there's a little bit of thinking that we wanted to put into that and some research and some thinking to do. So I just wanted to raise that because we've kind of said to the, the people looking at this around what gets read out, what makes sense and, and, and how, what we're thinking as well. Anyway, I'll be quite sorry. Well, it, uh, it would, it's probably a useful point just to pick up on that if you're con contemplating uh, sort of more radical schema changes that other than just sort of minor tweaks to NAPTAN, um, then it would make a huge amount of sense to be looking at the trans model and NetX model because that's got a full accessibility model. And one of the things I'm going to mention, talk about in a couple of minutes is this uh, um, sort of European work that's setting out, trying to get a sort of common basic minimum standard for it. Um, and if you were to do that, it would also probably be easier to link the populating of the what's in effect the NPG localities with other sources because the NetX has a generalized model for storing that. So, um, and I would also future proof you for integrating with uh, an updated with the FAIRS model and the uh, uh, future trans exchange uh, successor. So you really should be looking very seriously at that as that's a sort of joined up. Um, same yeah, we, we've had those conversations with Dr. J already, Nick. Okay, well, I'm just reiterating, other, otherwise yeah, you'll yeah. just Helpful. be inventing yeah. your own little wheel on it, which won't be economic. Oh, yeah. we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Sorry, Julie, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this. My apologies. Um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And what we're trying to do is to ensure that we have the funding to do that properly so that any changes that are, have to be done by people, there is the funding to go through and do it. We don't want to put all of the weight on local transport authorities to say, oh, you now suddenly have to meet the standard which their software doesn't meet and all of that, because I, I, I think that's not the way to do it. 
No, and to the main, that's actually the main motivation for trying to use a wider standard is the people building open source tools for adding all the accessibility data in and think and um, you know interchange cross interchange accessibility and all that's all the kind of there's the, the issue with accessibility data is really getting to um, getting a business model that works or getting it populated. Um, Okay, thank you, Nick. Julie. Okay, um, my question is about um, people knowing that a, a vehicle or a stop is accessible before they travel. So it's not about the accessibility of the vehicle itself once you get on there. It's not about, um, it's really about the fact that accessible information is not a mandatory part of the new trans exchange schema and it's not a mandatory part of NAPTAN. Um, and I understand that there is a um, a workload on the local authority potentially to find out whether a stop is accessible. But it just seems to me that somewhere we've missed a trick. So we've got great new accessible vehicles with everything on they need. We've got a new NAPTAN that will have all these fields in, but there's no um, there's nowhere in BOTS where it's mandatory for you to tell a customer that the vehicle is accessible or that the stop that they're boarding the vehicle from is accessible. So there's a gap. Um, and actually preparing yourself for travel takes more time for people who do have accessibility needs. And, I don't know where that's going to come in, but we've, we've dropped it somewhere between the two two projects, I think, unless you're going to tell me it's somewhere else, which would be great. Um, so, um, yeah, Dr. Jay's got work going on um, with that, and you're talking to the accessibility team um, in the department, um, and so there will be some more stop work done with, with NAPTOWN, won't there? Yeah, um, so just to be clear, current NAP10 can only handle 2.1 data. If you give it anything else, it just chucks it away. It's got no sense of what to do with it. We're handling up to 2.4 uh, in NAP10 2.4, but 2.4 also doesn't include accessibility data that's only available from 2.5 onwards, which nobody is giving us yet. So that's why we're sitting down and taking a pause and going, do we move to 2.5, which is partial stuff, or do we look at getting funding to do the big jump to NetX so we can do it proper? Um, how do we how do we do this? And that's one of those little pieces. And Julie will definitely be working with you because I think you've got some really good viewpoints to bring in to help us build that business case um, of what is going on at the user for the person trying to use public transport, because yeah. face it, the country's getting older. There's going to be more people who are going to need accessible public transport. Yeah, I mean, we created um, for, I mean, Transport Direct for 2012 created an accessible journey planner, and for all the game sites and all of the transport hop on points, they um, surveyed all the stops, and you could do an accessible journey plan in 2012, which you can't do now because the data's not been kept up to date. So I just think that. You know, there's some great things set out about accessibility in um, the National Bus Strategy and in the William Shapps report. And actually, Rail is getting there. They're doing some really important work with being able to access a train from a platform um, on a, in a level way. But we, we kind of haven't done that. We haven't made any progress in 10 years on this for people who can't. You know, so you can't bring up or, or find out or use a website to know whether the bus you're going to get on can take your wheelchair or not. And what we're saying is we've got some great projects that might enable that, but we still can't do it. And I, I do think that somebody at DFT needs to pick this up because we can't just keep saying it's not possible because of course it's possible, we've done it before. Um, so, so if it needs to be on this on this agenda, because it just drops us over, we talk about accessibility and actually we're not talking about accessible information, we're talking about the actual vehicle or the actual stop and not pre-planning. So I don't know where we need to put this back on the agenda, but it, it's the word accessibility doesn't cover it as it is. No, you're right, Julie. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions about accessible information? No. Okay. Julie, you may as well okay. unmute again. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, okay. So uh, I'll just give you a quick rundown about what we're doing with the TNDS, um, some of the work we're doing with BODS, some of our new projects, and I'll give you a plus spot overview as well. Um, because we now, obviously, you know, we already run, we've just started running Plus Plus. So to start very quickly with the TNDS, we are going to continue to provide it. The TNDS is called the Travelline National Dataset because we needed to run the Travelline Journey Planner. So we're producing it for ourselves anyway, and we make it available for free to other users, as many people who want to use it. 
So currently we have, as you probably all know, a version 2.4 um, and a version 2, sorry, version 2.5, which does have low floor flags in it. Um, and we have a version 2.1. So we don't consume the 2.1, but there are a lot of open data users that still do that, including um, Google. So we maintain that data set so that um, legacy systems can continue to do journey planning. Um, we don't have a plan to stop doing a national data set, um, but we may start taking the data from BODs. And actually, that, that's kind of linked into that 2.4, 1.1 profile, because until that's locked down, we can't finalise our import of that data type. And some of the things which are still unclear are quite fundamental. So it's still not 100% clear whether you'll be able to, the idea of submitting a number of a collection of lines per services in the current draft, but I think the ticketed versions of data that we've seen are multiple timetables, you know, trying to exchange files split into multiple timetables, so there might be eight or nine files per, per line. Um, and we're waiting to see if that's also going to be allowed. So um, it's, there are some quite fundamental things in there that we need to know, because of course, aggregating the data from, when you've got eight timetables, you've got an in and out for a Friday, Monday to Friday, which are two separate timetables. Um, and we know that, that that's like that, because that's how scheduling systems work but most of the local authorities from whom we get data now consolidate that down into a single line, a uh, single file per service to make it easier for us to knit together. Um, we've also had some fun with closed school services. So we have updated, um, Amy's done a huge amount of work with our bus operators. So we've taken data in now for, for all of stagecoach and first week. I think we've just got the final um, reaches of Scotland to roll out in the next couple of weeks. So the data we use for them is not the data they publish on BODs. Um, we've been specifically asked by the groups not to use that 2.4, 1.1 yet because it's not ready. It's not quite ready for us to be able to publish. So we use um, their Trans Exchange 2.4, the stage coach that they use for their own journey planner, and it's the same with, with First Group. So it's not the BODS data, but it is the data that um, comes direct from the operator. Um, we're going to stop there. We were going to do a go ahead, a read around National Express bus, but we're so close to having the 2.4, 1.1 tied down to a point where we can have it published by the DFT and understand that we should just get one version of trans exchange from every operator that's all accurate and well quality checked and works really well. So it'd be great when that happens. Until it does, we're just going to stop where we are in terms of incorporating operator data. We're still getting really good quality data from the local authorities around the country. And you know we don't have an ambition to um, downgrade the, the quality of the data just so that we can keep up with um, direct data from operators until we know that it's good quality. Um, so moving on to what we're doing in Travel Line, we are just about to kick off a new project. Um, we've got a new partnership where we are creating demand for public transport by partnering with um, big um, places that you can go to, to admissions like Blenheim Palace, English Heritage. So we're negotiating um, discounts for people who arrive car free. So this will cover um, public transport, not just bus, it covers rail and anybody who turns up without a car. So the idea is to um, encourage people to not bring their car because they get money off when they get there and that in itself will we've got a website that will have all that information on it all the plus plus information for each one of those is on there and we'll be creating some um, promotional features maybe 20 to 50 um, plus plus adventures where we have um, a travel writer from the guardian who's going to be doing the pros for us and it's got some really good photographs and it's really about the customer experience because we've kind of forgotten that in all this systems work we haven't talked about what the customer wants and where you might go on your bus, train, car, scooter for a long time. So we want to kind of bring that back in. So whilst we're doing some of the more technical work on Plus Bus, which I'll talk about in a minute, we're also doing um, sort of a drive towards people using public transport more. And for us, an important part of that is telling people how accessible the places they're going to. So we can tell them how accessible Glenham Palace is and where they can um, hire their shop for shop mobility and their scooters from once they get there. But um, unfortunately, we can't yet tell them that the bus is accessible. So we're doing those on individual projects. So it, it's quite, we're quite excited about it. Um, it also means that we can start um, curating the offers that operators, both train and bus operators, already have in place. So we've uh, mined all the two-for-one offers that are available on national rail inquiries, and that's on those pages so that they kind of link together. Um, we've got lots of... Um, bus operators locally who already have negotiated free admissions or reduced admissions in their local area. So we'll put those on our system and then they will also be told about the ones we've done. So we should have a bit more of a joint offer. And so if you were going to 
talk about mobility as a service as it was first launched, you know, back in Bordeaux and whenever it was 2016. Um, being able to buy a bundle of products, including getting into somewhere that isn't something that's not transport, is really kind of where we're going. So that will go live from the beginning of July. We've got our first two to go live, and that project will run for at least two years. Um, we're going to restart our customer research about what people want to use Traveline for. So just before um, the pandemic, we engaged Transport Focus to do um, some focus groups and some questionnaires about what information people want for public transport. So we did one very generic one that would help everybody who provides public transport systems. Um, and we did a specific one about what does Traveline do, looking at how people use the website, what they liked about it, what they didn't. Um, and then we were going to send out um, 3,000 questionnaires, but the pandemic happened and it just didn't seem right or accurate to be able to be asking people about how they felt about being on the bus because you know there was a very strict message about don't get on the bus um, so we're going to pick up that project we probably won't run the questionnaires but we probably will publish the two bits of data that we've got so far um, because apart from anything else I think nationally and with BODS and with, with all the systems talk we've got it would be really good to reopen the conversation again about what we're going to be doing about telling people that these things exist so you know, we've seen so many projects, great IT projects that do brilliant systems, but we don't tell anybody what they do and they don't get used and they tend to fall over. So we're trying to um, do them at the same time. Um, we are also on the plus bus side, we are um, we're in the middle of several barcode trials for a plus bus e-ticket. We haven't decided whether it's going to be E or M. But um, the one that's closest to being realised is part of the West of England uh, part bus partnership. So we've been working with GWR and First Group there, and we've seen our first successful trial of a dummy barcode by Ticketer as validating it on bus. There's also trials going on in several other um, local partnerships around, around the country. We're talking to ScotRail about what they're doing as part of their new franchising that's just going out now. So there's a huge amount of work being done already on moving um, plus bus to a barcode ticket. And we only picked this up on the 1st of April. So Travel plus bus has only fallen within my area of responsibility since then. So we've learned a huge amount about the progress that's been made. And we've, we've certainly had in the last few weeks, even before the Williams Shack report, which of course um, supports the use of plus bus and mentions it by name alongside cap, cap tickets. Um, yeah, so we're very close to having that trial completed. Uh, and the next stage is to get the ticket itself through the complex processes that RDG put in place to make a ticket a formal ticket. So it has to be approved as a ticket type. Um, we've got to start thinking about validation because the reality is that not every bus is going to have a ticket machine on it that can validate a plus bus ticket. But at the moment, it's done visually. So part of the design of the ticket will have to be something that's recognisable. So each of the retailers, the 20 odd rail retailers, because don't forget, plus bus is not a bus ticket, it's a rail ticket. It's managed by um, the rail settlement plan and it's it's a rail ticket that allows you access to travel on a bus it's the only, only, only place that that's done across the uk so um we've got some work to do on how we roll out the e-ticketing how we tell retailers about it what we do with rdg and how and how we tell the tops and the local scheme coordinators but it's a huge project as you can imagine um, and we've already had quite a bit of interest from several tops who want to start moving other projects that they've got under the umbrella of Plus Bus so that they can take advantage of that integrated ticketing um, brand, if you like, or, or what's being promoted. So there's a huge amount going on behind the scenes in terms of what we're doing at Travel Island. Now, most of it's new projects, so um, that's, that's pretty much it. I don't know if anybody's got any questions or, or if there's anything that I haven't covered. Very exciting. There's a lot going on. There is, yes. Any questions for Julie? Yeah. Um, can I ask one about the, um, Julie, you know you mentioned about you getting the data directly from Stagecoach and First. Yes. Um, does that mean that in TNDS or, or if, if, if I did a query set for, for say Leicester for, for yeah. a First route or a Stagecoach route that, that's within Leicester, I, I, the data would, that I would get back or would be using would be the data supplied by by um, stagecoach or first as opposed to what the local authority may have put into their system and sent to you separately yes yes so, so um 
Yeah, so we've coordinated with the local authority on that because, of course, they have to stop sending your photo data so we don't have duplicates. And part of that yeah. process, part of the work behind the scenes that Amy's been doing is we've set up a test version of the journey planner. So, for example, in Yorkshire, we put all of the test first group data into a test planner so they could look at it before they agreed it was good to go. Um, and what, that's where we come across the closed school services. So um, first group publish um, on spot all of their services, including closed school services. So they've um, had to put in a, the marker, the true false marker for public use, which is only available in 2.4 and not in 2.1. So um, we can now tell which services of the schools. But yes, I'm going back to your question. Um, it's coming from the operator for those areas. When you download the TNDS, there is a service list in that every time, which is a CSV file, or sorry, a text file, and it tells you the source of the data. It will say local authority operator, or eventually it will say BODS if you get it from BODS, so that you can all see the provenance of where the data comes from. Because, okay. you, yeah, it's just such an important thing when you're downloading data from BODS or wherever that you know whether it came from the local authority or the operator, because, you know, tracing it back is quite important. Right. So are you getting updates from the operators quite on like a weekly basis then? The stagecoach data we publish every week, but they're updating it continuously. It's the same. They have a bucket of, um, of data for each of their um, depots. So we have, I don't know how many there are for stagecoach, but first group we have data from 52 depots um, and they come to us as a single trans exchange 2.4 file per depot. Um, and we basically unpack that, stitch them into where we've got crossovers, where you've got half a service from each depot. We stick them back together, um, convert them into single line 2.4, and then convert them back into 2.1 as well. So that the TNDS looks exactly the same for every user. You shouldn't know it's operated data other than the fact that we've put that in the um, in the orders at the end. Uh, that, so I'm, I'm I'm just interested that uh, I'm interested to know of, of, of the, the mechanisms behind it because. I think one one of the things is not it's not an, an observation about travel line. It's just an observation about um, that there there are lots of versions of data flying around and and operators do because I look after the real time system in Leicester and I I basically take the data normally from the operator or, or the best place I can get hold of it. But, but operators are some operators are complaining about the fact that they're they're having to sort of spend you know data create multiple versions of data from their scheduling system to to, to say to me for a real-time system to bods uh, to, to every all and sundry for their ticket machine all of which are slightly they should all there should be some commonality but there's no guarantee there may yeah. be some differences between them and some glitches uh, all, all of which th there's possibility for error with all that complexity and obviously we're in a state of transition but it, it is it is something that i imagine will tighten up over time but but it, but it mean, isn't ideal at the moment i know exactly well certainly in in travel line we take we still get that cosif from some local authorities you know and convert that into trans exchange so it's it's phenomenally complicated behind the scenes uh, and for us, the biggest benefit of BODS is the fact that you'll have that single version of Trans Exchange that everybody's using that's the single version of the truth. And unfortunately, because there's been a slight slip um, in delivery, it means that there's all that uncertainty in between where you've got different versions of almost 2.4, 1.1 being published in some places. And it's very difficult to, to manage as a data consumer, which is kind of why we've said, OK, let's just stick with enforcing first and stage codes. That was hard enough. Uh, particularly because one of them is just move scheduling systems um, and, and wait until we've got some stability on BODS before we start taking data from there. I mean, don't forget, we, we have the um, small operator data for all of Scotland and Wales, which probably won't be on BODS, and we have um, ferries and some things that may not be on there. So as soon as we've got a measurement on BODS of what they've got and what we've got, we can do a comparison and work out um, a plan for the future. So we're just it's a watching brief, really, on, on progress on BODS. Yeah. Yeah, that's. It sounds like you're in a, re a really strong position, probably to advise me uh, down the line as to where where the best place is. But that's all good stuff. Thank you. Okay, John Carr, and then we ought to move on. Yeah, thanks, Julian. That all sounded very encouraging. I may have missed it, but is uh, plus plus information going to go into bots? That's a very good question. I mean, I've, I've seen from um, Stephen Penn's um, presentation earlier that one of their 
requirements for the FAIRS tool, FAIRS or whatever it's called, um, my FAIRS, sorry, um, is to have plus bus data in there. But of course, it's a rail fare, so it, it doesn't technically come under bus. So I think there's quite a bit of thought that needs to be going into that. Plus bus fares are more complicated than any other fare type because not only really? do you not have all operators, you only have partial services to the end of the boundary. And there's also journey planning rules that you can't have plus bus fares between some pairs of stops, some pairs of stations. So it's even more complicated than you probably imagined. I mean, it's not really until I've looked at behind the scenes and I thought, I don't know how that sticks together. Um, so we've got several, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of pairs of excluded interchanges that you can't buy, buy a plus bus ticket between at the moment. So that would need to be held in the NetEx data as well. So I think it would be a challenge. Um, but I understand that they would like to do it. So we have not been directly approached yet, but it's certainly been talked about at yeah. the program meetings. I mean, it, it's always been a weakness of, of plus bus that it's an easy concept to understand. But as you say, it's terribly complicated behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. But if, 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 you, if you could, when you do your journey plan, say you can get a combined bus rail ticket and here's the price for it. Yes. Um, that is exactly what the uh, department is trying to achieve for longer journeys. Well, in case in fact you can, all of the rail, rail regions can already do that. But what they can't tell you is what the buses are and what time they leave. So, that's so they right. can already. So that's that's the missing bit. Even though they, in fact, ironically, Silver Rail is our journey planner provider um, for Travel Line, and obviously, is Ipsys is the same, a very similar product that underpins National Rail Inquiries. And so they never, the, the, the rail have never really had an ambition to show bus times before. But as you'll see from the William Shapps report, that will all change. So we'll be in a situation where we have the great um, British Railways being able to do everything. And I hope that includes bus journey planning as well as just saying you can get a plus bus. There are so many things that are complicated about how plus bus is delivered. You can have two different ticket machines on a platform and they print them out in different ways. Some of them offer you a plus bus at the beginning, some at the end. Um, some of the smart card tickets work better than others. Only TOX are allowed to have smart cards with plus bus on, only two do. Um, it's it's quite a complicated product, but the brand is great. People understand it. It's really, really easy to understand what it's trying to achieve. Um, but yeah, I think we've got a challenge in simplifying the uh, the actual, it's easy to explain what it is, but actually using it is complicated. And I've learned that because for the first um, three months, I'm doing all the customer support. So all of the emails come through to me to answer. Um, so it's Julie plus plus admin is the result they get. But it means that I'm understanding how the systems work and where people struggle. So it's been a really um, useful learning experience. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Next. Thank you, Julie. Um, so next, um, we've got EU standards development. There's quite a lot going on there as well. Thank you for uh, bearing with us, Nick. Uh, uh, hi, um, yeah, I'll turn my camera on even I hope, hope I brush my hair. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's sort of three main items to talk about. Um, so one, there are two um, new work items. So that's a proposal to do um, a new piece of work that's been approved and that's going ahead. Um, and so um, if anyone's interested in joining those working groups, um, do step forward. Um, so the first of those is a control action. I think um, Tim circulated uh, um, the work item paper, paper on that. So control actions are, are a structured representation of what goes on in a control room when you're actually operating a service. So you might be doing things like canceling a particular journey, changing the crew, short running, uh, changing a vehicle over because they've driven down, or they've broken down and so on. Um, so, and it's so, so um, they're often quite useful because they might even be planned, you know, sometime in advance. Um, they're, they're kind of the upstream version of, of a user message, of a situation message or an alert that the customer sees that's explaining that something's happened, but they also might include things that are um, happening that are purely of operational interest. Anyhow, so this proposal is to have a, a series service that you can exchange these control actions. The control actions themselves have, be, um, have been modeled in Transmodel for a, a long time and are sort of, so I think are quite well defined already. Um, and, and it's quite, it's, and it's quite a small, you know, I think there are um, about four main types of them and then each of those is broken down into subtypes. So it's not a huge amount of things, but it's, it's just a, a new 
um, real-time service for exchanging data between control systems. I don't know how widely, um, where there's a wide interest in the UK at the moment. I mean, some of the European systems run on very sophisticated exchange of information between systems, but um, yeah, I, 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 don't, um, I think it, uh, the sort of equivalent here happens in the railways, but not really so much between other modes. But um, it's, uh, I, I'd just bring it to your attention if anyone's interested in participating. Uh, are you, Tim? Are you are you going to be following that as under your sort of um, Siri hat or? Yeah, I will. Uh, okay, so Tim, Tim has at least got a, got a one uh, British finger in the pie, so to speak. But uh, if if there are other people who's ha have it particular interest in that, do do get in contact with Tim. Um, the second um, work item is only just starting, and this is on um, this is a, some work to do a European accessibility information, so for mobility impaired users, and it's so um, so Transmodel and NetX set out a, a quite a wide range of um, accessibility attributes and properties and information that can be specified about stops and on vehicles. And what it's going to be trying to do is to, is to set down a minimum subset that everyone should be trying to uh, use. And I imagine that that will be tied into the European um, ITS requirements for European countries to conform with. We, we won't be, of course, forced to comply with them, but they're still useful to um, know about. And I think the, I mean, the other real value of this is it will, uh, will all, we'll almost certainly see good tools to capture that data, which um, will, will be of wider use yeah, uh, uh, emerging over time. It's being led by um, a Swiss, um, uh, um, Matthias Gunter from the Swiss Railways. Um, and, so, and again, if anyone's particularly interested in, um, in being involved and in following that work, um, it might be interested, of particular interest perhaps to the NAPTAN people for the understanding accessibility data for stops. Um, so that's the second work item. Um, and um, yeah, if you're interested, contact me or Tim and we can put you in contact with the, the working group. Um, and um, then the third thing to talk about is the alternative modes um, specification for uh, NetX and for Transmodel. So um, this is a piece of work that's been going on over the past 18 months to slightly extend both Transmodel and NetX so that you can cover the sort of new modes like cycle sharing and um, carpooling um, and uh, um, um, ta uh, taxi services and, and um, rental services. Um, so the, the aim is if, uh, what we want to be able to do is integrate um, journeys, or obviously if not traditional journey types of conventional modes with a new mode. So as a, a journey planner can give someone a seamless journey right across the data set. Um, and so there's um, a, uh, we just uh, finished a draft specification that's ready for review. Uh, for So the, the in the send process that now goes out for anyone and in, interested parties in the countries to um, look at and comment on. Um, and the comments are sent back and addressed and then the countries will vote on it. So. Um, but the schema, um, the schema is is also completed and pretty f and firmed up, and we have some examples in it that's available on the GitHub site. Um, and if you're interested in the um, seeing the the, the send specification, and this is yeah, this is a way of getting a, a free copy because when it once it's been formally voted, it'll be um, uh, it'll be chargeable. Um, then then get in contact with. Um, Tim or myself. Um, and um, a couple other interesting things to mention about it. Um, we've be, uh, part of the brief was to make sure that um, we could interoperate with the ex some of the existing services like BBFS, that's the general bike sharing format, which is the sort of Google um, type format for giving cycle sharing data. And the um, ICSI, which is a German um, carpooling car sharing service, and Tompe, which is a Belgian um, car share it, car pooling service. Um, 
and um, so the aim is well, obviously their APIs that are doing the real time exchange for custom services, and that's fine and great. What we want to be able to do is make sure that the, all the points, the data points that you travel within, so the stops and the uh, so the concept of the stop isn't doesn't necessarily have to be a public transport stop. Now it can be a designated spot or designated meeting place, um, and um, so there are, uh, work has been done to do a precise mapping between the GBFS data and the um, NetX data. Um, and we, uh, the, um, the NetX team is uh, now having sort of regular discussions with the um, open the GBFS and GTFS teams. Um, as they're, they're run by a, um, an organization called Mobility Data. And uh, I think this is a, it's actually extremely good news in the long term, as it means that kind of the two largest de facto data sets uh, are, are now gradually being aligned. They kind of, I think, recognize that once you get into anything over a certain level of complexity in terms of wanting to have operational data or wanting to have full definitions of affairs and so on, it's more than the low hanging fruit that they aim to cover. And at the same time, um, uh, uh, you know, everyone I think recognizes that the places where lightweight APIs are the, are the right solutions. So, um, but the, if what one should be aiming to do is to make sure the data is, is interoperable so that you can both cover the richer model where you need it or the lightweight API where you need it downstream finally to deliver it. So, um, um, so that's really a quick roundup of those three main points. Uh, and whether there are any questions? Any questions on standards? There's, there's an awful lot of work that's gone into that NetEx um, stuff, and it's it's a it's a it's a good read if you like standards. Um, it's it's more readable and understandable than quite a lot. So. Uh, uh, Done a good job there, Nick. Thanks. It's a, um, there's a, there's are, are some shorter presentations on it too that we could um, I can, we can probably um, add add to what documents to circulate after the me uh, meeting or something that'll give people a little bit more detail. Um, yeah, that will be useful. Yeah. Um, if there's no questions, then um, a plug for um, a webinar um, in June. You can sign up through the RTIG website. Uh, I'm doing a session on Siri 2.1, so the changes between um, the current release of Siri and the new one, which includes things like occupancy, where most of the discussion has been, but it also includes interesting things about uh, vehicle formations and uh, and new modes um, that's in there as well. Um, so uh, so yeah, come along to that to find out more about um, what's in Siri 2.1. Um, I've not had um, any issues raised um, in advance of the meeting. Um, so we uh, then I guess move on to uh, any other business. Um, has anybody got anything else that they want to raise that's public transport information related? No? Okay. Um, in terms of next meeting, um, when do we want to um, meet? Because I with um, restrictions easing and things like that, I suspect people will be looking to um, go away and have time off over the summer um, if it ever warms up. Um, and so I don't know whether best off having the next one in September rather than trying to fit one in in sort of the back end of July, which is only sort of six weeks away. Yeah. Okay, so we'll come up with a early September date then. We can if there's something that crops up beforehand, we can always uh, put another one in the diary. 
Okay, in which case, um, if there's nothing else from anybody, thank you all for your time. Thank you for those that have uh, provided content into it today. Um, it feels like it's been a good session. Thank yep. you all.